Cool. So, um, uh, good evening. I'm I'm Karthik. Uh, I work for SAP. So I actually uh, drove from Waldorf uh, to Wiesbaden, beautiful city here. Um, uh, I'm actually uh, I work as a senior data scientist uh, at SAP, and I also work with Google um, for most of the open source technologies, uh, especially on machine learning and um, Google Cloud. So what we will uh, discuss today is basically uh, some introduction. So just to, before we get into all of this, uh, I wanted to understand uh, how many of you are new to machine learning? Okay. So it looks like quite on, only a few of you guys are new to machine learning. I'm not sure if all of this would basically be a, a bit of a, an introduction because um, I wanted to give an introduction. I wanted to give everybody a chance to understand what machine learning is about uh, before we spoke about fancy neural networks and uh, you know all the deep learning and all that. Um, in general, uh, one of my uh, also my uh, job is to ensure that people understand what machine learning is and more importantly, what machine learning is not. So. Because at SAP, we need to actually talk to customers and uh, make them understand that machine learning cannot solve all the problems. And uh, this is also something that we need to make people understand. And uh, before we, you know, as a data scientist or some a machine learning practitioner, understand that machine learning cannot solve all our problems as well. So just because media says all the you know fancy things, it's it's not generally true. When you get into uh, developing and uh, you know deploying machine learning algorithms, you know that it's basically better mathematics. So uh, we, we will get into all of that and uh, we will see how and exactly what uh, all of this fits into uh, place. So uh, if you look at it, so if you look at an overview uh, in general, so this is basically some slides that uh, Google actually has. Uh, so we actually talk about how uh, AI uh, actually started like close to 50 years ago. And uh, what we're talking about deep learning here is basically just a subset. So uh, if you talk up to mathematicians, mathematicians wouldn't agree with this diagram. But in general, this still holds good. So in general, uh, this deep learning is still a subset, a pure subset of machine learning. Uh, we were doing machine learning for the past 50 years or probably 30 years. It's just that it's become more fancy and uh, it has become more beautiful. You know, it, it has made more, uh, yeah, it, it's made to look better on the media. That's all at the moment. And uh, it's also primarily because of the fact that we have better uh, hardware to support all of our machine learning algorithms. And that's one of the reasons why we have good uh, deep learning algorithms uh, in that sense. I will also talk about what deep learning is and uh, probably also give an idea of wh why are we talking about uh, deep learning at the moment, what happened. And uh, basically, if you look at it in 2012, um, Basically, there was this competition which showed that GPUs or uh, graphical processing units that people used to game uh, came into place and then it actually helped in uh, solving most of the problems. It actually made sure that the, uh, the challenge won with the deep learning algorithm. Uh, the, the slide here talks about what typically happens. So uh, in general, like I said before, when you talk about machine learning, uh, you need to understand whether you need a machine learning algorithm or not. Uh, when you see, you know, when you talk to a customer uh, today, uh, when a customer says, hey, uh, I see machine learning, I want machine learning in my, uh, you know, something to do with a simple problem. Uh, in general, uh, you don't use machine learning when you can actually solve a problem with rules. So if you can actually say, hey, uh, I can actually make things, you know, if I just uh, say monitor my steps, so I have a Fitbit or an Apple Watch, and if I can monitor my steps, and if I say, you know, I walk at four, less than four kilometers per hour, uh, you know, number of uh, my speed is four kilometers per hour, probably I'm walking. Uh, if I, between if it's four and less than something else, then I'm running. And so if I can make it into rules, then generally you never go into machine learning because this is going to work 99% of the time. Uh, and it's generally more explainable. So this is one of the reasons why uh, we are actually, we would generally advise not to actually use machine learning at all. And with GDPR in place, uh, what GDPR also talks about is uh, if your customer asks for explanations, uh, you have to give an explanation. When you say, I have a fancy neural network, I don't know what is happening, uh, that's not going to be a valid answer to your customer. So in this case, you need to basically explain. And in general, if you can do a machine, like if you can solve your problem with rules, then generally you don't need machine learning at all. So coming from someone who's actually 
practicing machine learning on a daily basis. Uh, this is a bold statement, but yes, this is true. So you, if you can solve a problem with rules, generally don't go for machine learning at all. Uh, that's a pretty standard statement. However, uh, things fall into play. Uh, yeah, you, you know, generally, it does not you know, happen, and you, you will get into a situation where uh, standard rules cannot solve. And this is where machine learning can actually help solve your problem. So uh, non-linear uh, non uh, functions can be really, really uh, learned well by a machine learning algorithm. And this is where uh, we will be talking about, so if, especially if you've not seen, uh, if you've never de uh, developed a neural network before, uh, to today you'll understand uh, some simple algorithms that can actually say, you know, uh, solve your uh, rules or fi figure out these rules for you. So, in effect, what will happen is, I think there is also a slide over here. Yeah, this is exactly. So, the traditional machine learning is where you have rules and you actually feed data to it and then you actually get answers. But in the, in the other sense, what will happen is, you actually feed uh, the answers and the data, and machine learning actually spits out the rules. So effectively, this is what is happening at the moment. So you have a neural network or a model that's actually being trained, and what the neural network is saying on the other end is that basically uh, it's saying that these are what is happening. So with your data, uh, this is what I see. So I see that, okay, you give me some fancy records, and you say that, okay, this is not what it is supposed to look like, and I say, okay, let me then try to fit it. So this is also, this also comes back to something called bias, and uh, you know, uh, human beings in general, we are biased. Uh, in general, I look at someone, I immediately, my brain is tuned to actually think about, okay, Who's this? A layer, you know, what, what person is? Where is this person from? Is this a what gender? What is the person's gender? Is this person tall or short? So all of this actually goes through our mind because it's it's evolution. So we've done this through evolution through millions of years. Uh, but this also knows the fact that m most of the data that we create is also biased. So whatever. So this is one of the shortcomings of machine learning as well. So if you look at what we are feeding the machine learning algorithm, we are effectively feeding it the answers as well as basically the data. So what happens is the data that we produce is already biased. And when you're going to feed this biased data along with the answers, we are going to make the machine learning algorithms also biased. And uh, I think if you read uh, news, uh, news uh, articles and things like that, you would actually have seen Google and Amazon and all of these companies actually get into trouble because of the fact that the, the bias, the data, there was uh, data bias in the data. And this is something that is also a very active research that we're also working on uh, in, into ethics, into bias, into fairness. All of these are very, very important topics. All along, we've done fancy neural networks, making it 154 layers deep, make, getting it 99% accurate, and uh, we've done a fantastic job with all of that all along. Uh, but what we realized sooner or later is that uh, this is not sufficient. Uh, to a customer, to a human being, if I'm going to make 99% versus 94%, it's not going to add any value. But the point is, if I'm going to be biased, if, if it's going to say, hey, you are basically a, a you know, you are a guy and you have certain characteristics, you, if you're going to be stereotyped versus someone else is also going to be stereotyped in some other case, then this is a problem. So this is where we are going to come in. And this is some areas of research that are also going on. But uh, in general, uh, this is something that I also talk about in general, because uh, at this moment, when someone is starting with machine learning, uh, you need to understand that uh, just because you have some data and you get some results is not going to solve your problem. You need to understand implicitly, is your data fair? Is your data biased? All of the, if you understand that, you can actually develop a reasonably good algorithm. Uh, so one more part I also wanted to say is, uh, this is, uh, please don't, this is, I'm not giving a lecture here, so if you have any questions, uh, this, is, this is not college, this is not school, this is not university, you can ask me questions immediately, let this be as interactive as possible. Uh, I can walk up to you or you can, you can interrupt me, please feel free to do so, uh, just wanted to uh, keep you uh, updated there. So, having said that, what are we effectively doing with a neural network or uh, uh, we, what we are trying to do is we are actually mapping all these features or all these um, inputs into some sort of another representation. Uh, this is a typically called a feature. And uh, things like, you know, again, like I said, uh, if we take, uh, for example, a car, what is a brand? What is a color? How many wheels? How, what is the type of engine? Uh, how many liters? Is it, is it diesel? Is it petrol? All of these components are going to be different features for a, you know, to describe a car for example. So th just like that, so is it going to be walking? So is this person, how fast is this person walking? Is, is this person's stride length so much? So these are all different features that we can use to categorize this again. 
Um, so this is what we do. This is typically called a supervised learning. So where you have this label, so you have this input vector or an input feature, and you're basically saying this is what this means. So if you basically walk less than four kilometers per hour, then you're typically, sorry, if you're uh, moving at less than four kilometers, then you're typically walking. So this is, again, uh, just an idea of what is actually happening behind the scenes. And this is why it's also called uh, a black box. Effectively, uh, it's not generally human readable. So unless you are uh, like probably like Alan Turing or someone who with a, a, a fantastic mathematician uh, who you can add John Nash who can actually understand uh, just given this binary number what that means um, in general uh, we cannot uh, you know perceive what's happening behind uh, in general it's also a vector so it's basically a matrix or uh, in, in a vector which is going to you know say uh, this is a representation of a particular feature and this is one of the reasons why um, we can also not explain. So a neural network is going to you know, take an input and it's going to convert it into a vector. And in general, when your customer asks, why can't you explain it? Well, because this is the reason why you can't explain it. It's going to be a set of numbers, a set of floating point variables, which are going to be represented, representative of the input data. It could be an image, it could be uh, you know, a song, it could be a video. It's basically going to con you know, convert it into a set of a string of numbers. And effectively, it's, it's not human readable, it's not human comprehensible, but generally what will happen is because your neural network learns what to do with it, it will know exactly what that number effectively means. And this is the reason why we are actually trying to go back and say, okay, let's take a step back. Can we actually explain this? And this is where uh, different lo lots of research is actually going on as well. So, yeah. So, like I said, so if we have three labels, can we actually label another one? That's again a different areas of research called one-shot learning, few-shot learning, and things like that, which actually come into play. Where it's going to say, I've learned these three features. Can I, you know, I've, I can I, these three activities? Can I actually generalize and say, uh, given a new activity that's neither of these three, can I actually classify it? So this is another area of research, which is actually a very interesting area of research as well. So either you're given no, uh, you know, no variables at all. Human beings are excellent at this. So if you go to a kid, if you teach a kid, uh, say for example, uh, give the kid a toy dog, and then take the kid, you know, give it uh, just one dog, and then take the kid on the street, and the, dog, the kid will be able to identify immediately any other dogs on the street. But a computer will not be able to do that. You can take that, of course, I don't want you to take your computer out to the street, but effectively, if you're going to teach your computer uh, one particular dog, it's not going to see another dog and say, hey, I actually saw this, this is a, you know, some sort of a new dog, but it's not, a, so it's not going to do that. In general, you need to, this is one of the reasons why you need a lot of data. You need to show a lot of examples before it can actually understand and generalize uh, on a given particular class or given particular category and things like that. So, having said all that, yeah, so we actually do, this is what effectively a uh, neural network is, looks like. So, uh, you will see that this is where also you have, uh, this is, um, let's not get into all the details. We probably are already 20 minutes down. Uh, there is going to be different talk about uh, training phase. There's going to be a prediction phase, uh, inference phase. So prediction and inference are basically the same. Um, so once you've trained a model, you are going to use that model to basically say, uh, predict new data. So that's all on new data. Can you actually do this uh, prediction or inference is, is effectively the same. It's just a different jargon, that's all. So effectively, this is, this is all that's happening. So uh, you train a model and then you deploy the model and then you test it. So, and um, in general, all of this will happen at different times. So you need input data there, you need uh, so train data, validation data, things like that there. And uh, on the, in, the, in this side, you will have completely new test data that you would like to test. So this is, these are different examples of where deep learning is helping out. So this is uh, in uh, actually identifying um, the blood pressure and then actually predicting whether uh, there is go you're going to have glaucoma or things like that. Um, there is also a beautiful uh, example of how uh, deep, deep learning has been used in uh, predicting uh, different solar system activities. Uh, again, this is an example where in, I think in Switzerland, they actually figured out, uh, um, you know, uh, the, the disease of a, a cows or, yeah, there are lots of examples where deep learning actually helps out. And uh, yeah, there are lots of examples you can actually go and then I can actually share this slide as well after this. But your smart reply on Gmail is also an example of uh, machine learning or language, uh, this is language training. So effectively what 
Google is doing is it's trying to understand how you generally reply, and then it's trying to understand this language model, and it's building a language model behind the scenes. So this is why the minute you start typing, it's also leveraging a lot of people's data and your data, and then it's called fine-tuning, effectively. It's, it's doing it on your data, but it's actually learned from billions of people's uh, emails and how they've written some sort of sentence and things like that. And that's a standard example of language learning, language pre-training, for example. Uh, yeah, these are all different examples of um, uh, how um, Google, or in general, how um, machine learning has been used very, very successfully. So, um, how many of you have learned, or, or how many of you have used, or how many of you have seen TensorFlow? Okay, quite a few, that's nice. Uh, have you guys used PyTorch? Any of you use PyTorch? Okay, that's new, okay. So in general, so uh, I would like to keep things open. So in TensorFlow is one of the libraries um, that is used in general for a good computation um, in general as an open source Apache 2.0 licensed uh, library. Uh, there are also other uh, frameworks, uh, other deep learning libraries called PyTorch. Uh, there were a few more called CNTK, uh, Cafe, and things like that, which became pretty much obscure uh, because of the fact that PyTorch and TensorFlow pretty much rule the roost now. So if you talk about any research papers in general, PyTorch has a very good research um, uh, community which actually implements papers. And if you're generally into natural language processing, and uh, there you'll get a lot more resources also on PyTorch. Uh, so I just wanted to keep things open. I, I don't want to say that this is the only thing uh, that you have to learn and you have to do. Uh, TensorFlow is also one of the best uh, deep learning or computational libraries that you can use. And in general, Python is the preferred front end. So uh, today what we will do is we will uh, use a lot of, uh, is that a question? Yes. yes. Um, what is PyTorch compared to Keras? Oh, okay, perfect. <laughs> Super. So Keras is basically a high-level API. So what Keras does is Keras is, we, we'll also sh uh, see something, some examples in Keras. Uh, TensorFlow also implements Keras now. Keras is basically a high-level API. Uh, so it's basically like, uh, say, for example, C++. And uh, you write a wrapper around, say, the core C++. Uh, then what happens, so Keras is something like that. You make your underlying low-level uh, APIs much more easy, easily e readable. So what Keras has done is it's made a very beautiful API that can actually make your life much easier. So you, uh, if you typically generally use scikit-learn uh, back in the day, or even people use it today, uh, it has a very simple uh, dot .fit, dot .predict, and dot .probe, and things like that. So what Keras has done is it's followed a similar pattern, and it has actually created a high-level API. And uh, what the team, the Keras team has done is made this extremely successful that uh, a lot of li libraries actually use Keras now. Uh, TensorFlow uses it. Actually, this is the first class citizen at the moment. So if you see TensorFlow 2.0, Keras, I'll also show that example. We're all, uh, uh, so that's a, the, so best effectively, TensorFlow is a low-level uh, machine learning library or computational toolkit, and PyTorch is also on the same lines. What Keras is, does is it actually goes one level above, and then it makes life easy for developers, and effectively developing in, in, if you want to develop machine learning algorithm, it makes life easier by giving you a very simple set of APIs that you can actually write, and then you don't have to worry about you know uh, garbage collection and things like that if, if you have to, say, deploy a model. Model. Keras makes life easy in that sense. And uh, we will see an example where TensorFlow also uses in TensorFlow 2.0, Keras becomes the first class citizen. So the first way in which you actually develop a neural network in ten TensorFlow at the moment in 2.0 onwards would become Keras. So I, I will show how that is also working now. So yeah, at the moment, this is a pretty old uh, slide here. Uh, uh, this is now, uh, even now, it's actually number one. But yeah, let's not go into all of this. Let's just skip all of this. Uh, yeah, this is what I said. So. At the moment, uh, you see basically tf.data, which is going to be the way uh, TensorFlow reads data and then consumes data. So you can actually streamline this, and then you can actually store it in a particular protobuf format. What will happen is you can either use TensorFlow's low-level APIs or TensorFlow tf.keras. So tf.keras becomes the high-level API that you will be calling to actually uh, learn and uh, like have a deep, you know, develop a deep neural network. Uh, so this will be this is something maybe if um, 
if we have time, we can also go through how we can do that and have a simple example as well on that. But effectively, what will happen is, yeah, if you have multiple GPUs and multiple CPUs and multiple TPUs, for example, what a TensorFlow does is it lets your, makes your life easy. It actually has a distribution strategy which will actually easily scale out and then it will actually bring back all the parameters into one single place. And this is what TensorFlow does extremely well. Uh, with PyTorch, there is this limitation. This cannot be directly done. Uh, PyTorch has some limitations, uh, which TensorFlow actually does extremely well in. TensorFlow is actually, when you write code, it actually becomes production ready straight away. Uh, you can write code uh, on a research paper and then bring it straight into production uh, with a TensorFlow serving pipeline, and uh, you have very nice, well-written documentation with TensorFlow. Uh, on the other hand, PyTorch is trying to come there, but it's, it's not yet there. I think sooner or later they will be there. But at the moment, yeah, just to give you an idea of what are the you know shortcomings here and there, uh, TensorFlow is at the moment still winning by a large margin, but PyTorch would probably sooner or later catch up there. But the community-wise, TensorFlow is significantly larger, and there is a huge community across on the internet. Uh, locally, if you'll see, you'll actually see a lot of Google GDGs and a lot of uh, communities also helping TensorFlow and talk about how we can actually develop neural networks as well. So, yeah. So effectively, yeah, this is, these are different things. This is, on this side is where, again, TensorFlow wins hands down. So if you look at the TensorFlow serving, again, like I said, it's going to, you can move into production straight away, uh, no problems asked. So we are doing that at SAP as well. Uh, when we develop a neural network, we, move in, we have TensorFlow serving pipelines, which moves uh, uh, code directly from research into production. On the other hand, when you're going to have, say, if you're going to develop an application on, say, on a mobile device, then TensorFlow would do that as well. So TensorFlow Lite is where it actually takes a trained model, converts it into, say, if you have an iOS device, you can actually push it onto an iOS device or an Android device. Of course, Android device takes a first class, uh, but uh, Swift for TensorFlow actually does a very good job at the moment in also taking your code from uh, you know, research and moving it into an iOS device as well. There is a huge push on uh, Swift for TensorFlow as well. Uh, so that's also an excellent uh, push there. PyTorch does not directly support that at the moment. Uh, TensorFlow.js is another, if you're a web developer, this is a pretty cool feature. So I can actually show you an example of what's happening with TensorFlow.js. You can actually run your uh, TensorFlow model on your mobile phone and straight on the browser. So that's how cool it is. So with 20 kilobytes of uh, neural network that you can actually run on your mobile phone, that was never seen before. And it's actually possible with TensorFlow.js. So if you have a Node.js server, you can actually deploy it, and then you can do fancy things as well. Uh, but yeah, so all these are possible with uh, TensorFlow, and this is what shows. So the last thing is TensorFlow Hub, uh, where a lot of trained models, pre-trained models are given away uh, by the community and by Google. What happens is uh, it lets you uh, not you know, train the model again and again. Instead, you use someone else's trained model, and then you will try to deploy it, or you can actually use it for your own uh, applications, and you can develop on top of that. So that's the idea with TensorFlow Hub. So yeah, there are quite a few platforms, especially on Raspberry Pi. This is a pretty new thing that's also happening. So if you're interested in, say, deploying something like an IoT device, I'm actually doing one at home uh, to actually monitor my plants. Uh, that's actually a fancy algorithm that's actually running for a very simple task. I am uh, <laughs> at the moment it's a bit of an over-engineering, but it's still fun, a lot of fun when you actually have a Raspberry device lying around and you would still like to do some uh, fancy machine learning algorithm. But nothing fancy about it. It's about how you can get something so small like a Raspberry Pi to run a complex neural network to do something very, very interesting. So that's all about it. And then you can think about face recognition and all that on a Raspberry Pi. So if you want to ha you know, mount a, a face recognition system on your door, uh, then you can do that as well. So you can actually get Google's uh, uh, AI project and then AIY project. You can actually mount it on your doorbell. And then you can actually, the moment someone shows up on your door, you can actually see if that person, you, you know that person. If you don't know all that, you can actually do all that. Uh, that's also possible. But yeah, these are some ideas that I also tried. And yeah, it, it works well, but uh, in general, it might not be necessarily uh, useful in the long run, or it, you might need more data and you might need more patience in general. So yeah, I don't want to go through TPUs and uh, all of these. I think we will skip this at the moment. Um, if you're interested, we can go through this. But uh, this is how the old uh, TensorFlow code looked like. 
But with TensorFlow 2.0, what happens is, like I said before, TF.Keras becomes the first class citizen, and you will become, you will make things, it makes life easier. Uh, this was never the case before. If you've written code in TensorFlow 1.x, life was pretty much bad. You need to write a session, you need to run ses things in sessions. Let's not get into that. It's basically, it was not very user friendly. Uh, now, things are much more competitive, uh, and you, you actually, uh, all the compute runs like uh, NumPy, example, for example. And yeah, you, you can actually write things which are much more clear, uh, much more consistent, much more intuitive to understand. Uh, because again, like I said, uh, TensorFlow leverages Keras. So uh, let's not worry about all of this. Um, one thing, if at all, you would like to do, uh, I would like you to take home is uh, basically this one. So uh, if, you're, if you're interested, go to colab.research.google.com. So this is a very, very useful resource. Uh, if you're running, uh, say for example, um, uh, if you want to say train a um, neural network and you don't have a GPU, for example, um, Colab will come to your help. Uh, what Colab is, is basically, uh, so just before, before I go into what this is, uh, how many of you have used a Jupyter Notebook? Okay, a few. So uh, then I will just give you an idea of what this is I'm showing here. This is basically a Jupyter Notebook uh, in some sense. What Google has done is uh, a Google, uh, a Jupyter Notebook is basically um, a web application which runs, um, Py or not Python, but necessarily a lot of uh, kernels behind the scenes. Uh, Jupyter, as you see, stands for Julia, Python, and R. So that's why the so spelling is J-U-P-Y-T-E-R. And actually, it also supports a few more. There is also a C++ on time that you can c configure, and you can do a lot of things with it. But if you see this very simple, uh, this looks like a web page. But what it can actually do is it can actually run uh, neural networks over here. So if you see this example, you're going to actually, what we are doing at the, uh, at the behind the scenes is basically uh, downloading some data set, and we're actually extracting the questions from the data set, and we're actually saying, okay, let's print it. But I think we've not done some initialization before. Yeah, over here, there's a setup environment, which I've not run. Uh, let's run that as well. But you see, uh, it's very, very powerful. Google gives you, uh, if you see the runtime, you can actually um, have a GPU, or you can actually run a TPU, uh, if you want to go fancy, if you, were, you can run a tensor, tensor processing unit or a GPU, GPU here is a T4 pro, uh, uh, GPU. Uh, so if you want to run or if you want to learn neural networks, and if you don't, if you don't have a GPU or if you don't have resources to, uh, if you, you don't want to basically ask your manager to buy you a GPU, this is a wonderful resource. So you can run, um, you know, any of the uh, your. Um, uh, experiments over here, uh, you can see the results straight away. So this is a Jupyter Notebook where uh, your code runs and the output is actually shown right below the cell. So this is one of the reasons why I want to show this and then have you know that so when next time when you want to try a neural network and you don't you know, want to run something, then go to Gula, uh, Colab. Um, and uh, one thing, again, I would like to stress is uh, do this for experimentation purposes. Don't take customer data over here. Uh, this is something that I would like to say every time and any time. This is purely for experimentation uh, and for you to have fun and to learn. So if you're going to take customer data, it's, it's, uh, the onus is on you. The responsibility is on you. Um, it, of course, if your customer, customer clears it, then go ahead because uh, the point is that this data is going to lie on Google servers. So if your customer is perfectly fine with that, go ahead and uh, enjoy and try to see if you can actually uh, make a neural network learn. But yeah, so this is an example. I can actually show you a few more examples, but effectively what will happen is uh, if I run this now, it will basically say, uh, yeah, it will be, yeah, like you say, it, it has downloaded this data and then it is actually looking at the data and then it's printing out the results over here. And if you see below, it's also saying how much time it took and it, you can also do a lot of fancy things with uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And with Colab, what happens is uh, you can keep everything in one place and then you can actually share this and simultaneously work with people and things like that. Again, I'm, it's not, it's an open source uh, library, it's an open source system. Uh, I just want to share this so that people can have access to more resources and know about things before you get into buying a GPU and wasting money on GPUs for a single experiment. So this will be really useful effectively if you want to learn machine learning and if you don't want to spend uh, money on GPUs. So this is one of the reasons why I should want to share this. So if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take. Of course, yes. Uh, so whatever I share will be uh, uh, for free. 
So uh, otherwise, there's no point, and I'm not trying to make money here. Uh, the idea is to make it into a community effort, and if it's if it's for community, I want to make sure that people get free access to education and basically resources, so that you don't have to run for resources. This was not the case like four or five years ago. Now everything is available at you know on every browser. So this is why I wanted to share all this. You can, if you're interested, you can actually download the Colab uh, code and run it on your server also. If you don't want Google to run all your data and your uh, computer. But this is, of course, for free, and it's it's so that is also uh, one of the limitations. So because it's Google is uh, alloc allocating resources for you, uh, there is any chance that the GPU might go away. So it's just that you have to reconnect. That's all. So you, that's not a big deal if you are experimenting and things like that. So yeah. So. These are some examples, so text generation. Uh, I have some examples as well uh, where you can actually feed in uh, Star Wars scripts and then what the neural network will do is effectively produce a new Star Wars script. I think there was a recent article on uh, uh, Game of Thrones. So basically what they did was they fed uh, all eight seasons script of Game of Thrones and they actually made the neural network uh, write an alternative ending to basically Game of Thrones in the eighth season. But that was a very nice idea, but I think it, it was not really interesting, but it is a good fun weekend project, especially if you want to learn machine learning and uh, how things work. So, yeah, these are different things. Again, I, I don't want to spend time here. Uh, if you just to, if, if this is the first time you're looking at uh, Keras and this is the first time you are looking at what a neural network is all about, uh, so this is how generally a neural network, uh, a simple neural network, I would say, looks like. Uh, you see there are here there are two dense layers with one dropout. Uh, let's not go into detail over here. Uh, what it's doing is you have uh, fully connected layers over here, uh, which is fed, uh, which has some nonlinear activations. And it's also, so if you see basically in 10 lines of code, you've written a complex neural network. Uh, it's not too complex though, but still you've written a, in some sense, a shallow neural network, but people in the media would like to call this deep neural network. Uh, this is two layers deep. Uh, effectively, you can go, there are uh, fancy neural networks which actually go 154 layers deep. So if you see this and multiply it by 80 times, you will get pretty much the deepest neural network. Uh, at the moment, it's called ResNet, and there are actually other, other neural networks also. So if you see NVIDIA doing its self-driving car, it actually deploys a very, very deep neural network to actually uh, understand and uh, simultaneously segment, identify people, uh, identify cars, and things like that simultaneously in a single neural network. Uh, and it's, it's an expansion on top of this. So if you can run and if you can understand everything on this code, effectively you should be able to expand on top of it, scale up, and then you should be able to learn what a convolution neural network is, just a, a residual neural network, LSTM, bidirectional LSTM, and things like that. Then you will be able to understand what NVIDIA is doing or Google is doing, for example. Uh, and yeah, we can do all of that. And uh, uh, yeah, let's probably start with our, um, our cloud study. Uh, because it, uh, I, how many of you are interested in actually running all of this? Would you be interested in actually coding something here? Or would you want to go into the study jam already? Because the study jam is purely into Google Cloud and how to leverage Google Cloud resources. Probably if you're interested there, maybe it's better to switch to the Google Cloud study. This is, I just wanted to give an introduction to uh, what TensorFlow is about because we are going to run uh, neural networks uh, on uh, Google Cloud. Uh, I will give you the access to the resources so that you can actually run a neural network, uh, but it won't be, you, you, won't, you wouldn't have to tweak the neural network or you wouldn't have to do anything. Effectively, you will be leveraging Google's APIs, but I can talk about the API and give you an idea of what's happening behind the scenes. Uh, but maybe let's switch there.